Let's move on to secondary fermentations now, not the primary. We've talked about all these options that the winemakers have been doing up and to and including that primary fermentation. Then we took a little TV timeout, talked about barrels for a good long time. Now let's get back to finish off our wine, but there's a couple of other steps that can occur before we put it into a bottle. Many steps actually, but this whole section of steps we're gonna call the secondary fermentation. Now this can be simply a continuation of the primary fermentation, it can be. And remember that during the primary fermentation that 65 or 70 or 75% of the alcohol that's going to be produced is usually cranked out in the first three to five days. Those yeast get in there, they go to work, things happen really fast. However, once they eat up the majority of the sugars in that juice or must, things are gonna start slowing down. The radical activity that's exhibited in the first week will slow and that's for obvious reasons. The sugars are running low, the alcohol has risen, that means it's a more challenging environment that the yeast are living in. So they're gonna start slowing down a bit, procreating a little bit less, uh, slowing down their activity, slowing down the transfer of sugars into alcohol, the release of CO2 and all that stuff. But even though they've slowed, they still have 30% of those sugars to go, or 25% or 45%, whatever it is, they still got to get that stuff taken care of and converted into alcohol. And that can happen anywhere from a week to a month to a few months. Again, always depending on what the winemaker is shooting for and all the other variations of fermentation that we've discussed up to this point. What's the temperature? What's the yeast using? What's this? What's that? So all that other stuff goes into play of, oh, how much longer is it going to take to finish this thing off? Now we could call this slower period of finishing off the primary fermentation. You could call that a secondary fermentation, although most of us don't. Perhaps it's better to call it a secondary phase of fermentation, a secondary phase of that primary fermentation. However, here's where things are going to start to change no matter what you want to call it. And it's going to change because we're definitely going to be moving the wine from one container to another, even if no other processes are occurring besides the continued fermentation. And that is really important for the processing of the wine, simply moving it somewhere else. Why? Well, once we are moving things, starting to move things through a different container, we're going to move them to a clean container whether it's a stainless steel tank or another clean and fresh uh, a wooden fermentation vessel or if we're going to move it straight into barrels. Uh -huh. For red wines, and this is something we don't have to think about for whites, if you've got white juice that's turned into white wine, you can move it anywhere you want to at this point, but for reds, now we're going to get back to processing it just a little bit more because you know with the reds, they've been creating wine in must. And now that the biggest work of the primary fermentation has finished, now we're going to take all that stuff and transfer the juice that's now wine, the liquid wine, we're going to transfer that out to another tank or another barrel. But we're also going to take the rest of the must that's left and press it. So remember, with white wines, we pressed them and got rid of the skins and the seeds and all that stuff before we went to primary fermentation. It's at this point in red wine production that we go ahead and take off the wine that's there in liquid form, ready to go, and we're gonna press, send all the skins and junk back to the press and press out all the remaining juice we can get out of it and it's whatever remaining tannins and colors we can get out of it, squeeze all that out and you could, as a winemaker, just put all that juice back in with the, uh, uh, the wine that you already siphoned off, or you could actually put it in a separate fermentation tank or a separate barrel, and winemakers do both ways. They can uh, basically allow the pressed must juice slash wine to finish fermenting in a barrel or a tank somewhere else and then re-blend it back in later if they want, or, get, or just go ahead right from the get-go. Send the wine over, send the red wine to another tank, Send the bus to the presser, smash all the rest out, and go ahead and put that straight in there too, and then let it all finish together. It's up to the winemaker. In either case, 
for whites and reds, no matter how you're going to process your reds, we are cleaning up the wine a bit. We're removing the sediment, the solid materials of the must, and the dead yeast. Those yeast might be microscopic, but once they live and procreate and die in the hundreds of thousands and millions of millions, their little microscopic bodies start to add up. And you can see them in the bottom of the tank in kind of a film or a little dust or a little cloud. I'm introducing this term to you right now because it's going to come into play at the end of this lecture. All that accumulation of just the dead yeast cells is called lees. L-E-E-S. Lees. We'll come back to that in a minute. So, back to the processing here. Uh, if we take our wine into a barrel, as opposed to taking this cleaned up, you know, filtered, fined, clarified wine, you could put it into a stainless steel tank and let it keep hanging out, or you could at this point go ahead and put it straight into a barrel. And if you go ahead and put it into a barrel, you might be continuing the primary fermentation, but also you're kind of starting the maturation process as well, right? Because you know how this works. We put it into a wood barrel, and I've told you all about barrels. You know way more about barrels than the average person. Now you're going to start picking up wood flavors and aromas and tannins, and things are going to start to integrate. And because things are still happening in terms of a, a, a second phase of the primary fermentation, there's also going to be yeast that are still going to be procreating and dying and settling to the bottom. And there's also going to be whatever particulate matter, all other little microscopic pieces of grape and stuff that's floating around there, they're going to settle to the bottom of the barrel or the tank. So you sporadically, even during this phase, have to do something we call racking. Racking, which is you, you take a tube and you siphon off the liquid from one barrel into another clean barrel. And that's because all the junk that settles at the bottom, you want to siphon off the top and get the liquid out. You don't, you want to keep kind of cleaning up the wine sporadically as you go. And again, it's up to the winemaker how often they want to do this. Every three weeks, every month or two, I don't know. It's up to the winemaker. So transferring your still slowly fermenting wine into a different vessel is, I still think, best described as a secondary phase, secondary phase of your primary fermentation because you're still basically converting the, the original amounts of sugar you had in the juice into wine, okay? And that can go on for, again, months, three months, four months, six months, depending on the conditions and winemaker options. That's not what this lecture is actually all about, though. I'm just continuing on the story of how wine is made. This lecture is actually about real secondary fermentations. And there are distinct processes that can occur that, that are truly and totally independent of the primary fermentation. And these are the ones that I want you to understand in just as much detail because these process, processes, you can do one or many, are true secondary fermentations that do alter the wine in fairly important ways. And I'll go through them in no specific order, but one, you can have a true, separate, completely individual alcoholic fermentation, a sugar to alcohol fermentation by yeast, okay? So these are secondary things that after the primary is completely done, no matter how many months it's taken, this is something that's gonna happen in a second phase. You could have one, a totally new and separate alcoholic fermentation. More important is number two. You could have something that's called a malolactic fermentation that occurs by bacteria, not yeast. Hmm, we'll get to that momentarily. And three, something I love to talk about is you could also have lees contact. Lees? Didn't I just tell you what those were a minute ago? Yeah, those dead yeast cells. If you allow contact with lees, that will also affect your wine, and that happens during these secondary processes. Again, all three of these processes radically affect the finished wine in style in very distinctive ways that you, the consumer, will be able to taste, big time. Let's start with the easiest one first. During a secondary fermentation, you actually can have a full-on secondary alcoholic fermentation. 
but it's distinct. It's distinct because when I say a secondary fermentation, I am suggesting to you, no, I am stating as fact to you, that a secondary fermentation that includes alcohol production is completely different from the primary fermentation because the primary fermentation would have been allowed to go the distance. That is, you allow the yeast to go all the way to eat all the sugar, to make all the alcohol they can, and that's it, they're done. They will die because there is no more food for them. And it's at that point, whether it's a red or white or whatever, you're going to filter it or clarify it or cold stabilize it or, and then move it to a totally distinct new container to undergo another fermentation for very specific reasons. But wait, 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 wait. You've learned enough in this class now to hopefully be raising the question in your head, wait a minute, Boyer, you just said that the yeast ate all the sugar in the primary fermentation. So if the sugar's all gone, all their food is gone, how do you get another fermentation to occur in another vessel? <laughs> You're going to add in some more food. You're going to add in some more sugar to kickstart it and get it to do something, but to do something very specific because you're not really trying to get more alcohol out of a secondary fermentation. You will, okay? But you're actually going to do this secondary alcoholic fermentation for a different reason. Now, the way you do it is, remember when I talked about yeast starters? So you get uh, some more yeast, active live yeast, and uh, you get them whipped up into a frenzy, and you're doing that in some of the original juice, okay, that still has sugar in it. So you've got this batch, and you're going to then pour that into a barrel or into a tank, wherever your wine that you've already cleaned up is now sitting. Now, again, you're going to put a bucket of this stuff in. I, I'm not using specific numbers because it depends on the size of the vessel you're fermenting in. But, you know, let's just say you're going to have a bucket that you're going to pour samples of into your barrels. Let's say you've got a bunch of white wine and it's in 20 barrels. So you're going to go and pour some of this, some of this, this much, pour this much into each one of those barrels. You And this is a sugary solution that has yeast already working in it and you're going to then dump that into each one of these barrels. That triggers the fermentation process once more and it's doing it not so much because you want alcohol, because it's you've only put in a little bit, so you're just going to make a little bit more alcohol, but not that much. You're doing it because it's also going to create those byproducts of fermentation, which are heat, which we don't really want either, but CO2. Ah, maybe now you see where this is going, because I intentionally said you put it in a barrel, because that's not really how you do it. How about if I had suggested to you in this process that we put our finished wine in a bottle? And we have a thousand bottles in front of us. And then I go take some of this yeast starter nutrient juice and I poured a little bit into each bottle and then capped the bottle real quick. Ha! Now you got it. What you're really doing is, yeah, you're in this secondary alcoholic, uh, secondary fermentation, that is an alcoholic fermentation with yeast. What you're really doing is getting a little bit more alcohol, whatever, but you're trapping the fermentation in a bottle or a tank. You can do it in a big tank and you're trapping the CO2. Ah, I, I had a feeling you probably read ahead of me on that one. This is a process by which we make sparkling wines because in primary fermentation, we usually have it open-ended or valves so that as the CO2 is produced, it's allowed to vent off. It just goes away, which means that the wine is still, it's table wine, it's still wine, there's no bubbles in it. But at any given point during the fermentation process, if you cap it, you cap your tank, or you put it in a bottle and cap it, the CO2 can't escape, and CO2 will readily dissolve and stay in solution, and that's how you get bubbles in anything from soda pop all the way up to champagne. And we're not worried about soda pop. Who cares about that? That's what kitties drink. We drink wine, sparkling wine, if you're really awesome. So this is how you produce sparkling wine, and there are many methods to do this. I'm just giving the oversimplified abstract way that this is done. So there are traditional methods, usually called method champenois. There's the Charmant method. There's a cheaper industrial process. It's how you make soda or you discharge it. But you know what? However you do it, you're trapping the CO2 in bottles or in a tank that then you move to bottles. And voila, you get sparkle, you get fizz whenever you open your wine. 
you know, we're going to dedicate a whole lecture to sparkling wines at a later date, so let's make that a double date with some sparkling wines and someone that you love, and we'll go into all those details. Let's get back to secondary fermentations, though. Okay, a secondary alcoholic fermentation was number one. Much more uh, important for your understanding of table wines, of still wines, table wines, uh, is number two, malolactic fermentation. The malolactic mania is what I like to call it. Uh, as I've suggested, this is a fermentation that actually occurs by a bacteria. So a bacteria, all this time we said, oh no, bacteria are terrible. Bacteria are terrible for wine. They'll eat all your oxygen and turn it into, uh, they'll eat all your alcohol uh, with oxygen in there and turn it into vinegar. That's just one type of bacteria. There's lots of different types of bacteria and not all of them do the same thing. And this particular bacteria, we don't mind in the winemaking process. In fact, it might be in intentionally introduced to do these very certain things. Uh, what things? Well, it converts one type of acid to another type of acid. It converts malic acid into lactic acid, thus the term malolactic fermentation. It turns malic acid into lactic acid, okay. It makes a harder, harsh wine into a soft wine because one, you know, malic acid is harsh and lactic acid is soft, more supple. Uh, and flavor-wise, it will turn Granny Smith green apple flavors into buttered popcorn aromas and flavors. Oh, who doesn't like all of that? That sounds great. Now, think back to when uh, I chatted about acids in wine. And there was a bunch of them. Uh, there was citric and ascorbic acid in trace amounts, and the winemakers can use them to do certain things at certain times. Tartaric acid was the huge one though. Tartaric is still the huge one. Tartaric is the most important acid in wine due to the prominent role it plays, maintaining the chemical stability of the wine, maintaining its color of the wine, influencing the taste of the wine. Tartaric is still kind of the, the backbone that holds up the whole being of the wine and helps hang flavors and aromas on it, on the wine itself, which gives complexity. You, we can't stress enough how awesome tartaric is, but there's that other one. And the other most important one is the malic acid. And malic acid, it is one of the principal gra uh, acids in grapes. Again, citric and ascorbic and the others are pretty minimal. Tartaric number one. Malic's pretty big though. So it is one of the principal organic acids found in wine grapes. And it's actually found in just about every fruit and berry plant. And it's most often associated with those kind of a hard or harsh acidic flavors, I always keep coming back to Granny Smith green apples. When you bite into that apple and it's just like, mm, that tart, uh, yeah, that's malic acid. Now, the role of malolactic fermentation is to throw these bacteria in, and of course, just like most things, they occur naturally around wineries because they're floating around everywhere. The malolactic fermentation is important because it helps adjust the overall acidity of your finished wine. And how does it do that? Well, by eating the malic acid and kicking off the lactic acid, which lowers the overall acidity. And I know it says acid and acid, but not all acids are the same when it comes to things like pH. So malolactic fermentation, and you can abbreviate this MLF, uh, lowers the acidity by converting malic to lactic, and it also emits some carbon dioxide, but we again, for table wines, we just let that kind of vent off. Many white wines are encouraged to go through malolactic fermentation to soften things. Virtually all red wines undergo malolactic fermentation naturally, virtually all. Okay, let's get back to some facts then. We talked about all those other acids when we talked about grapes, but lactic acid is not naturally found in grapes. So I had to wait for now to talk about our final acid. <laughs> and what's the deal with lactic acid? Lactic acid, you eat a lot of it. It's in your body all the time anyway, but you eat a lot of it too, especially if you like anything pickled. So uh, a lactic acid is a much milder acid than malic and way milder than tartaric, by the way, too, but way softer, uh, more subtle than malic. Lactic acid is often associated with milky or buttery flavors and textures in wine due to the production of 
uh, uh, an organic compound called dicetyl. Dicetyl is one of the things that gets kicked off during this malolactic fermentation. And dicetyl, again, an organic co compound that I think is the exact compound that they sprinkle all over fake buttered popcorn to make it taste like butter. Hey, that ain't real butter you're eating at the movie theater, friends. That's a chemical, organic chemical that's been you know, put together in a lab somewhere or in an industrial base somewhere. And so dicetyl is, and we love it. It makes you salivate. Again, just think buttered popcorn, that overwhelming smell, that's dicetyl. And malolactic fermentation will make that. Um, malolactic fermentation is involved in yogurt production, cheese production, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, sourdough bread. I, I don't know about you, maybe you have a sweet tooth. I'm more on the salty side and these are all things that I am salivating now mentioning all these food items. Th this whole side of the food spectrum is like, mm, yeah, and lactic acid is a part of that and this malolactic fermentation is a part of it for certain uh, commodities that you are quite familiar with. So the malolactic fermentation is also, uh, uh, like we said, kind of a, a natural thing for most red wines because these little bacteria are hardy little critters and they really dig in, uh, especially in barrels, meaning that once you've done a malolactic fermentation uh, of some red wine in a barrel, unless you, if you ever use the barrel again, the bacteria are going to be hanging out there. They, they love it in those barrels and they dig in and they won't go anywhere. So once you've done it, it in a container, everything that follows in that container will likely also go through the malolactic fermentation, whether you want it to or not. Mostly they want it to. If they didn't want it to, they wouldn't reuse a barrel that had malolactic fermentation occur in it. Just as a side note though, um, this uh, malolactic bacteria, lactobacteria that we're talking about that's responsible for this, also can produce uh, histamines, triamines, and putrescines, which I don't even know what that is. But these three things, histamines I know you've heard of, histamines, uh, triamines, and putrescines, which may, may uh, be the cause of red wine headaches in some wine drinkers. So the kind of common mythology about red wine is when people say, oh, I get flushed in my cheeks and I get a headache from drinking red wine and Originally, people said, oh, it's because it's got too much alcohol in it, and you're alcohol sensitive. Eh, probably not. Uh, and then it became, oh, it's got sulfites in it. Oh, sulfites are so super bad for like one, one billionth of the world's population. Uh, but yeah, yeah, sulfites are bad, 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 bad. They got up this bad rap, and so, oh, wines have sulfites in them, so you must get headaches from sulfites. That still has not been proven anywhere. I mean, not even close. Some researchers are suggesting, oh, well, you know what histamines do? That's why you take an antihistamine during allergy season and lacto acid bacteria can produce these things that would therefore be in wine. So maybe, maybe it's this. I'm not suggesting this is fact, by the way. I said there's researchers looking into it. I find this stuff fascinating. Anyway, let me get back to the malolactic mania, what it does to wine. I'll revisit where I started with malolactic, which is it converts malic acid tart malic acid to a creamy lactic acid and with dicetyl as a product, as a byproduct, which is the butter popcorn smell. Uh, and of course, that's a hard slash harsh acid to a soft acid. Uh, it's a green apple, Granny Smith green apple flavor to uh, buttered popcorn flavor, tart to cream, if you like. And almost all reds undergo malolactic fermentation. Almost all of them. And, not to throw in too much trivia for you, the malolactic fermentation actually can happen simultaneously during primary fer fermentation. I'm not trying to complicate this in your brain. I'm just saying once you get a little further into winemaking, and some of you will probably become winemakers, uh, I don't know how many winemakers do it this way, but you can just kind of as you start your primary fermentation, you throw in your yeast, you can also just chuck in some lactoacid bacteria as well and do both processes at the same time. My instinct is that most of, and it that would still be called a secondary fermentation because it's different from your out primary alcohol fermentation. But in either case, my instinct is that most winemakers actually still separate it. So you do your primary fermentation for alcohol 
and then you would initiate your malolactic fermentation in a secondary fermentation phase once you've racked off your liquid into a fresh tank or into barrels. That's my instinct. I know that's the way for most fine wine. Uh, so almost all reds undergo malolactic fermentation. Put that in your brain. Most whites, at least a lot of whites, but not all whites. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No. Um, almost all reds benefit from this rounding off of that one malic acid profile. They still have high amounts of tartaric acid, so they can still retain their acidic backbone, and then they this, that other harsher acid gets rounded out by this uh, MLF, and then these kind of nice flavors are, are tied in that marry well with, say, the vanillin in the oak barrel. <laughs> right, right, right. And the softening of the tannins because of oxygenation and all these other things that happen during maturation. <laughs> so the addition of malolactic is like, oh, this is just another, another way to soften up and add flavors to red wines. However, not all whites undergo malolactic, and maybe you can think of why. And I'll just mention a couple of grapes. Gewürztraminer, Riesling. Do you, do you, have you had those wines? You have had a nice dry Riesling or even a semi-sweet Riesling from uh, uh, Germany? Would you like to taste buttered popcorn in that? Oh, oh, that's just terrible. Oh, it makes me cringe. Uh, some Flavor aroma profiles of certain grapes are just not suited for the addition of those flavors. Just not suited. Other ones I can think of that I don't particularly think would, are well suited to malolactic are Chenin Blanc, Viognier, and, and again, some of these we're talking about are very floral. They're crisp and fruity and floral, and they have these notes and a nice little acid backbone, and the introduction of of creamy buttery, just like, oh, the, oh, oh, that's that takes away from the character we want out of those wines. Although I'm sure some Viognier's undergo malolactic. I'm sure they do. But I like the ones that don't. And believe it or not, Sauvignon Blanc, a grape that I really love, uh, that I really love it because it it's so austere usually and acidic and sometimes abrasive, and I like that, especially New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, abrasive with acidity. But believe it or not, even they undergo, some of them undergo malolactic fermentation to soften them up. And that brings us uh, to a really good point of, okay, how, how would that be then? How do, you, how do you manipulate that in a white wine? Red wines all do it and it helps most all red wines, but not all white wines and not in the same measure. If you think about uh, white grapes, uh, and especially from different places, different climates, some have a natural huge amounts of acidity. Some, in, say from warmer climates, don't have as much natural acidity in the grapes. So depending on what you're trying to make, you may do no malolactic fermentation, no secondary on your white. You want it crisp and fruit, fresh and floral and whatever and light. But there's ones like California Chardonnay that got famous for malolactic fermentation and put that in your brain. They're the ones that pushed it over the top as I've, uh, suggested many times in our wine lectures that anything that people have done anywhere else uh, in America, we do it more. So malolactic fermentation was known in the old world and they use it to tweak wines. And then Californians got a hold of it and they're like, yeah, let's take Chardonnay and malolactic up the Yazoo and put it in a wood barrel and make it over the top woody as well. And that's why you get oaky, buttery California Chardonnay. Ah! Oh, see, you get it now? So that particular style is like, yes, it works really good. And they created this whole distinctive style, mostly or partially because of malolactic fermentation. But that doesn't work with all whites everywhere. So even Chardonnay, the same grape from, say, Burgundy, France, Chablis, which is northern Burgundy. It's cooler, okay, cooler area, higher acid. And you would think, well, if it has higher acids, that means it has higher malic acids. So shouldn't it have, uh, do more malolactic fermentation than even California wines? And the answer is no, there's no strict formula for this. Uh, do Chablis and white Burgundies use malolactic? Yeah, but they're so high in tartaric acid that even when you use malolactic fermentation to reduce the malic, they're still, still very acidic, still, can be almost austere or abrasive. 
So a lot of white wines that you would say, well, this is acidic, so it has acidic and almost sour and tart, so it definitely has not had malolactic fermentation. No, 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 you can't assume that. And a better example is, um, you can't assume that because many Burgundy wines have undergone malolactic fermentation, but maybe only partially. And even if it's a full malolactic fermentation, they converted all the mal malic acid to lactic acid, you still might have such high levels of tartaric acid that overall the acidity is still high. Does that make sense? And perhaps the best example of this that I just learned about recently is uh, one of my favorite summertime wines, Vino Verde from uh, Northern Portugal. This is a wine that I thought was, it's just a big acid bomb. And I'm like, wow, I love it. I mean, it's almost clear in color. They pick the, they pick the grapes almost underripe they're the first thing picked in the season, so they're super green grapes, and they're super tannic because they haven't even converted stuff yet, and they're super acidic because they haven't even converted a lot of acids into sugars. And so one with, when I drink those wines, I get, mm, you know, makes my mouth water right there, right there in the back um, because they're so acidic. And I just assumed, oh, well, of course, this has never had malolactic fermentation. And, of course, I was totally wrong looking further into its production. They actually undergo malo malolactic fermentation. Even in those thin, acidic, sour wines, they undergo malolactic fermentation because if they didn't do it, the Vino Verdes would be undrinkable. They would burn your tooth enamel off. They'd be so acidic. Because remember, we have more than one acid in here. So the malic acid may get all burnt up during MLF, but they still have tons of tartaric acid in them and maybe these other acids too. And lactic acid is still an acid, so even though you're manipulating and changing one type of acid from one to the other, and for particular wines like California Chardonnay, it, it makes it super round and super buttery. That does not play the same in all grapes from all places. Does that make sense? So they're just converting one type of, of acid, and if it's a wine from say Northern Germany or Northern Portugal, that's been, you know, picked underripe, super acidic. It's still going to be a super acidic wine at the end of the day, but they've tampered down at least one element of it. Makes me love wines even more, all right? California Chardonnay is the best example of what malolactic really in your face adds, because not only does it make it softer and more supple, it definitely adds in that buttery flavor that people have grown to love. But malolactic is actually not the only way to creamy cheese up your wine because there's one other thing we haven't gotten to yet before we get out of this secondary fermentation stuff and that is lees. I talked about the lees contact and at multiple points in this lecture and during wine creation you will rack off your wine from one tank or one barrel to another and racking is the process of moving the liquid off of the lees and any other accumulated sediment that has settled out of the wine while you're sitting there letting it hang out. Letting it hang out during secondary fermentation or even letting it hang out for you know two years while you're maturing it. Winemakers will rack off the lees regularly, okay? Okay, well, why would they do that? Well, because lees can add flavor too, and you might want to keep those flavors, so you might have intentional lees extended contact. Now, as I suggested, lees are the dead yeast, and yeast are microscopic, but once they live and die in the millions and millions and millions, they do start to form and, and fall out of solution. They do form a sediment on the bottom of the barrel or the tank. It's much the same way I think like coral reefs are made. Those are little microscopic organisms, but over time, with billions and billions of their dead bodies piling up, you can see coral. That's, think about that whenever you think about lees. You can physically see them. In fact, if you've ever had a unfiltered German beer, <laughs> right? Like an unfiltered Hefeweizen? Mm, I'm getting thirsty. An unfiltered Hefeweizen or an unfiltered beer, period, from anywhere, not just Germany, it'll have sediment in the bottom. If you swirl it, it'll kick up a, a, a cloud of dust. That's lees. That's lees, too, in beer. So you have that in wine. And this deposit of dead yeast or residual yeast and other particles that settle out uh, for a lot of red wines, you kind of don't want that. You want to get them out of there because they are dead yeast. And gosh, what do yeast taste like? Well, have you had any bread lately? Uh, they, in that bready, cheesy realm? 
and you might not want too much of that in your red wine. In fact, you really don't want any of it. You got enough going on in your red wine at this point. You don't need to add any more flavor profiles that are on the yeasty side. So for many red wines throughout the secondary fermentation as well as aging slash maturation, you will rack off your wine and put it into a new barrel on a regular basis to get it off the lees. For some whites though, you may want to leave them on the lees. You may say, hey, wait a minute, we like that flavor. I want those additional flavors in my delicate white wine, right? So to make those wines that will have flavors of lees in it, you don't rack off the wine, you leave it. And in fact, you might even stir up the dead yeast at the bottom so they have more contact with the wine itself that's sitting there aging. It's called, actually there's a French term, there's a French term for everything. The French term is batonnage, I think. <laughs> Hopefully I'm mispronouncing it. Batonnage. Uh, and that's where they stick this kind of curved stick down into the barrel and whoo, whip it up into a frenzy like you're whipping cream to get all the yeast back into solution and making contact with them. Now, okay, why do they do that again? It leaves a distinct, if you do this for long enough, they will leave, impart to the wine, a distinctive yeasty, cheesy, bready, cracker, think about munching on a cracker in your mouth after it's wet. All of those kind of aromas and taste can be imparted into the finished wine. What wine, have you ever had a wine like that? You probably have and haven't really thought about it yet. Champagne, most all sparkling wines that are produced in bottle, by their very nature of how they're produced, the lees, the yeast are sitting in there with it. That's how you get the bottle charged with CO2 is because you have yeast in there working and they're dying and hanging out. So champagnes, many sparkling wines that are produced through the traditional champagne method can pick up these hints. Some Chardonnays in different parts of the world maybe even California, because you like it creamy, buttery, oaky California wine, well, maybe you want to accentuate that even more by letting it sit on the lees and hang out. The other place that's super famous for it is in France. It's a region uh, uh, in the Loire Valley. Actually, it's right on the coast of the Loire, the mouth of the Loire. It's called Muscadet, and Muscadet wines are made from the Melon grape, and I have no idea what the melon grape actually tastes like because they allow it to sit on the lees so long. What you get are a lot of those, it, it, it's a very dominant lees flavor in the wine. And you may think it's gross, but you gotta go try it sometime. Again, many people like champagne. We like a little bit of that flavor around the edges. It's like, oh, I got a little yeasty, a little dusty, a little musty, a little funky, a little, yeah. That is lees contact. Now, because it does express very unique flavors, winemakers who are going for that distinctive style are going to tell you about it. And they're going to tell you about it by putting on the bottle Sir Lee, S-U-R-L-I-E. Sir Lee, Sir Lai, I guess, I don't know. Uh, Sir Lee is, they're telling you right on the bottle, this white, usually white wine, has been produced with extended Lee's contact and you should expect some of these flavors. So when you're shopping around, you're like, oh, what's this? What's Sir Lee mean? Is that the guy who made it? Nope, that means that Lee's hung out and you are gonna get a little bit of yeast. Almost, I should have said this here, like bread dough. Not even so much baked bread, but you know, when you're kneading dough. That, that's a real yeasty kind of, oh, mmm. If you like it, that's what Sir Lee will bring to the wine. Let me finish up our secondary fermentation here with our secondary summary though. Get on to finishing this stuff up. Uh, as we've suggested, several processes can be at play here after your primary fermentation or even during primary fermentation, but after your fermentation that will affect the finished wines in very distinctive ways. So you've seen how distinctive this can be. Uh, just to run through the gamut of everything we talked about. You could just, after your primary fermentation, uh, or at least the majority of your primary fermentation, you could just rack the wine off to another stainless steel vessel to chill out for a while with no other processes occurring. This will allow the wine to settle out the solids, you can filter it, you can clarify, you can do all these other things, but it adds nothing more to the flavors or aromas. And maybe that's mostly how white wines are made, okay? So rack it off, change it out, filter it, and move it to another stainless steel tank. It's not gonna do anything, okay? You could though, after your primary fermentation, 
rack off the wine to wooden barrels. And you could let it chill out there for a while and settle things out. Oh, I'm sorry, actually, you would have pressed the wine already to get a bunch of junk out. But you're going to let it chill out in wooden barrels and maybe even chill out and mature and age it for a while. You can do that without having any other biological processes occurring. You don't have to do all these things I've now told you about. And even if you didn't do any of the other biological processes, you are going to have several things going on. The other particulates are going to settle out. Dead yeast and grape particles are going to settle out. You, add, you are adding oxygen because wood is porous and it breathes. You are going to add flavors and aromas and tannins and trace amounts of oxygen. And evaporation occurs. Thus, all the things we talked about in barrels are going to be enriching and concentrating the wine, making it more complex. Again, I'm just telling you, that's just what happens without doing any other biological processes, all right? But we talked about in this lecture some distinct biological processes that are going to happen during secondary. You can have further biological activity if you, the winemaker, want it. And we talked about three. One is you can start a second true-on alcoholic fermentation in the tank or in an individual bottle by adding a little bit more yeast and sugar in, and that's how you make sparkling wine. More on that later. Two, we talked in depth about malolactic fermentation. And you can do that in stainless steel, or you can do it in wood barrels. I guess you could do it in a bottle if you wanted to by introducing this uh, lactoacid bacteria. And that's going to significantly change your wine by making it less harsh, more soft. Uh, you're, so you're changing the mouth feel, the feel of it itself. You're changing from harsh to soft. You're also going to change it from uh, sour to smooth. You're going to change it from tart apple to buttered popcorn. That's a fairly significant change. I should maybe back up. I should have said this like an hour ago. I'm not saying the wine turns into buttered popcorn. As with all of these secondary processes and lots of the options I've talked about that winemakers employ during the primary uh, fermentation, these are all options which affect the, the periphery that add flavor and aroma. I, I'm not suggesting that once you do malolactic fermentation, your wine tastes like buttered popcorn no matter what. <laughs> I mean, maybe some California Chardonnays, but they got to work to get it to taste just like butter popcorn. Anyway, number two is malolactic fermentation, which radically does change mouthfeel and flavor. And of course, number three was you can, you can elect to have extended lees contact in the barrel or in the bottle. Think about champagne, think about unfiltered beer. Uh, and that would add more yeasty, cheesy, bready, bread doughy hints into the finished beverage. Again, and that's usually specific for things like Muscadet, Champagne, and some other oddballs around planet Earth. However, that's about all the secondary fermentation options that can be played at this point. Maybe there's more, but I don't know about them. And you know what? The winemaker's game is about played out too. There's not too much more to do now besides age that wine or continue to rack it off, to continue to clean it a little bit, to get it ready to go into a bottle, whether you're going to put that in a bottle in a month or five years from now. So it's time to finish this off. Let's get to those finishing touches next and get this stuff ready for you to drink. <laughs>